splendid, excellent. Okay, welcome to the, I think this is the fourth in the series of the Commit Happy Hour, uh, a chance at the end of a week being locked in our own homes to have a few beers with some friends, enjoy a bit of a, a chit chat about some of the topics that should be on our waiting lists. And also just to have a, uh, a talk between ourselves about some of the issues and problems that we're facing whilst trying to work remotely within an industry that has in the past been a bit of a laggard when it comes to adopting technologies. I think this probably is gonna be one of the, uh, the revolutions uh, within our industry. And I think it will be certainly the, um, how would you put it, kind of the, the bumper that pushes us forward into doing a lot more remote working and being able to do mobile technology better. But today we have a great set of uh, people out there, James and Martin. Uh, but first, what I'm going to do is I'm going to hand you over to Stuart to tell you a little bit more about the um, webinars. So, okay. Stuart, I'm handing you, you over control of the mouse. Thank you, Ian. Don't, of course, forget to charge your glasses every now and then. I'm, I've gone on to, uh, I'm still drinking tea, but I'm drinking fortified tea today. Um, <laughs> so, uh, I'll must. I think you're gonna, you're gonna have to advance the slides, Ian, because it won't work. Okay, so, no worries. Can you send me to the first slide? Okay, yep. so um, this is very simple. We've got the um, control bar on the right-hand side. Um, it's very simple to use. If you want to minimize it, just hit the red button at the top. Um, but the important thing about this is if you've got any questions, raise your hand uh, or alternately, you can type the question in at the bottom. Um, the reason I'm saying raise your hand, yeah. <laughs> if you want to um, ask the question, then I will or we will unmic you. Ian's got the control of the keyboard because my keyboard is not functioning. Um, so we'll we'll do that when we get to Q and A. Now, if it's okay with everybody, we'll do the Q and A at the end, um, so that we can advance through the slides swiftly. Okay, next slide, please, Ian. So, as Ian mentioned, um, with a number of um, webinars that we've done so far, we intend to keep this going um, weekly. Um, it's part of the series "Commit to Productivity" about what productivity means to you. Um, do you in your organizations have the means to improve productivity, do you need some help? Um, we'll also take a look at what else is out there making a difference to other industries, businesses and, and organizations and if it can help you. And also, do you have a system or process that can help others and can you share it through the Comet webinar series? Um, so behind all um, technological initiatives in our industry is a simple goal of improving productivity and often the best improvements come from a combination of knowledge um, which is people um, a process and technology now so far we've we've delivered quite a few um, areas that can help individual organizations improve productivity and today's two sessions are well both cover um, good areas basically that can add significant value Next slide, please, Ian. So uh, I mentioned about the areas. Now, we've covered a couple of sessions on project controls. We, we've also looked at contracts. We intend to go right the way through the areas that we have um, identified as, as being able to contribute to um, improvements in productivity. And these are everything from digital asset management right the way through design change preparedness, um, involving the, the, the owner, materials management and control, um, interoperability, um, new materials and methods, including off-site fabrication and assembly, um, and of course, emerging systems and technologies. There's always new technologies being developed out there, uh, but we might not have got them all. There might be others. And combined all these, if you can advance the slide into, and again, um, all these lead to um, a fingerprint for success and we intend to focus heavily on each of those areas we have lots of people who've expressed an interest in one or all of those or several of them and we'd like to bring those people forward and get them involved in a little working group that we've got within commit next slide please Ian. now before i get on to today's 
sessions. Um, I'd also like to thank our sponsors, OT Business and Rebim, for supporting us in the series of webinars that we've, that we've been running now for over a year. Um, to do today's two sessions, ensuring safe distancing, distance practice, distancing practices on site with Visiline, uh, and how a construction data trust transform how we deliver projects. Now, first off, we've got um, James, who's going to take us through uh, from Visiline about how safe distances at this time can actually help us. So, with that in mind, James, over to you. Hello. James, Hi, Visiline, it's all yours. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, so obviously if we just go to the first slide and then I can just start talking about. Um, so everybody is aware we're all stuck in COVID-19 um, in isolation with lockdown and not uncertainties of what's going to happen. Some sites have started to go back, um, construction sites, um, some aren't. Um, so it's a little bit hit and miss. Um, if we go to the next slide, please, Ian. Um, what I wanted to do first, just because we're going to highlight on this key feature, but anybody that doesn't know what Visiline is, I'll just give you a very quick brief overview. Um, Visiline is a software provider. Um, we provide a construction collaborative project and production management platform. So what we do initially is we take any planning tool, uh, any software from Primavera's, Astor's, Microsoft projects, and we can import the plans directly into Visiline. What Visiline has the capabilities of doing is it's being linked directly to a field app. So it uses um, the workers out on the field, whether subcontractors, contractors, employees, site managers, snagging teams, etc., can all have access to the field app. So whilst they're on site, they can actually make changes and updates on statuses and alerts and so on. What we also have, which is quite key for now, is whilst a lot of people have talked about going digital, um, already we've had in the last two weeks um, several very large companies approach us. Can we start using Visilin based on the fact that they're in isolation and they can't do collaborative planning sessions? OK, so yes, no one's got no money to spend. The, all the budgets are held up, but Visilin have gone through a, a process where we are offering our solution for at least the next three months to anyone and everyone that wishes to use it. We're doing everything remotely. So all sticky note type scenarios where they have these weekly collaboration meetings, where they've got sticky notes on the board, they have to come together, doesn't need to be done. Um, with Visilin, we can train everybody and get everybody continuing to work with construction digitally. We also have the ability for 3D and 4D PIM as well, which is part of the product. But all of it is launched and logged in a dashboard so that even if people are even project directors we're finding that construction sites are open but project directors have all been furloughed so they're letting construction sites still work but there's nobody updating the plans so anybody that's not actually physically updating project plans but letting construction continue there's going to be a big backlog of data okay we track all this in the dashboard so if we go to the next slide please ian so key topic right now social distancing two meters between people, etc. cetera. Um, we cannot guarantee two meter distancing to work between guarantee and two meters to make sure that it definitely stands up that everybody is exactly two meters away. That's gonna be hard for anyone to overcome that sort of solution. But what Visiline have done, we've been asked by one of our large customers, um, Mace have asked us that they wanna get sites going back to work. They need the construction people working. However, they need to put some measures in place to actually prevent and say that they are ticking boxes to moving forward. So what we are doing at this moment in time, we are building into the platform the ability to track and manage the platform uh, from the project plan and, and safe distance of the amount of workers. So if we go to the next slide and I'll explain it a bit more. So what the questions that are out there at the moment is the regulations. What are the exact guidelines to work in safety? Health and safety measures from the government of putting measurements and telling you to do two meter distancing and wear PPE and stuff like that but other sites will still have the same measures but other sites are not opening up because they, they can't manage the, the resource from two meter distancing you know they can't track it so we're looking at the areas of regulations also planning how you're going to manage the workforce and being a place available to space between distancing so you've got people that are going to site and there are softwares out there at the moment I think for tracking type scenarios where they can sort of say oh somebody's here somebody's there somebody's over there but that's not linked to what plan they already had to do so this different softies, uh, software what we've 
we've also got is the ability of the, the safety measurements of this. And this is actually the real key is safety. It's actually going to come back. Two months down the line, when things start to become a little bit more relaxed, are people going to end up getting corona again whilst working on site in two months? There's no vaccine in place. They relax the sites, people go back to work. Who's to blame? When Joe Bloggs goes on site and, and he gets corona, and then the worker next to him has got corona, and he, he can't go on the furloughs now, so he's now been back to work, being paid. However, he's now gone off sick. Family's not going to get any money. Is he going to go trying to get public liability insurance cover? I don't think it's going to stand up. So if we go to the next slide, please. Visiline have come up with the ability to actually build the locations into the original plan. So even though people know what they're doing on a weekly basis, they have collaborative planning sessions where they do look ahead planning. So they look over the next 12 weeks of what is happening on site. They break that down from 12 weeks to three weeks, to next week and the current week. What we're doing is we've taken the ability to put inside of the product uh, defining locations and zones. Some sites already do this with their planning. They've already defined locations and areas. But anybody that haven't, what we're doing is we're having the ability to put in safety margins that you can actually, in one area, state that only 25 people can work in that zone at any one point of time based on the size. What the system does is as you start using your collaborative teams, start planning the work and dragging and dropping the activities, and you put, you've got four people coming on site from this one company, our system will flag up and so you can't have any more resources in, in this area. We're also being able to allocate this resource and plan the work out so that each worker can have multiple trades of people turning up, but it will still physically, when they turn up and you've said that four people are turning up, if by accident or by chance they send in five people because they think five are turning up, when you get to site and the workers then update that five have turned up, it will prevent them allowing them on site. So we're in the instances, what we're trying to do immediately is from now, which will be available in the next, uh, by the beginning of May, is the ability to start really planning the work before you go on site. If we go to the next slide, please. So what we're doing, is, as I just said there, we're built into the platform the ability to build the locations. When you select the location or the zone or the area or the department, it will then come up with all the activities that are to take place on that day or that week or that month where you can then allocate the limit of staff that can work in those zones. What WIS will also do is this is going to then be tracked onto our dashboard where it will actually have planned and actuals. So not just looking and seeing that people are on site using some sort of tracking element. We are actually planning before they go to site, we'll put the measures in place that we can say only certain amount of people can work in that zone. Now, once again, that's dependent on the people that turn up on site. However, we have got the ability from the mobile app to be able to update and state that some five people are in this area at this one time. This will show up and highlight on our dashboard so you will actually see real planned uh, workers versus actual workers. If we go to the next slide, I think there's one more, if I remember. <laughs> yeah, so here you can see here, this is doing location-wise workforce. So what we're doing is able to state that on a worker's device or the site manager's device, they will have a little workforce element where it will say on the 6th of April, the 7th of April, they have got planned three people coming in. They can actually update this from site then and say that four people have turned up, only one have turned up and so on. So this will allow you to manage and get real time updates. This is going to be tracked by the mobile and this is going to be due for release within 10 days. Now, very lastly, this is um, not going to tick every box to cover every measurement. But we are also working on the background at the moment the capabilities of tracking the actual uh, engineer or the work or the subcontractor via their mobile device. We're looking at all angles at the moment from sensors like Bluetooth beacons to GPS and all different types of uh, tracking elements. But not only will we have the ability to put in the quantity of people that are allowed safe distance into the platform beforehand, we will actually be in two months from now be able to track and see on the screen from a, a liability perspective that if somebody gets corona, you will be able to go back and see where they actually were and track that they actually went to areas they shouldn't have done or they engaged with another worker. So it's not to really go about the liability of the insurance. We don't want anybody to get sick or ill. But at the moment, there's still this very big grey area around two months down the line with corona coming back. What happens next? Will they shut construction sites again? Do they limit workers? All we're trying to do is put measurements in place to prevent the safety distances. And that's that's it. Thank you. That's fantastic, James. Really interesting what you're able to uh, to do with that. 
Uh, certainly one of the, the, the really big questions we've got at the moment is how we can get construction back to work safely, um, not only for the workers themselves, but also to show to their families what uh, measures are being taken so they're confident and happy with their workers, so their husbands, wives, um, daughters, sons, whatever it is, going to work on a site. Uh, and if you can show and prove that these um, uh, risks are being dealt with properly, then you know, you've got a, a much more um, willing workforce to come back and carry on working. So that is really good. Uh, Stuart, have we got any questions online at the moment? There's no questions that, that have come in, actually, no. Um, um, so I've, 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 I've got a couple, if I may. <laughs> <laughs> you know me, I'm always uh, uh, trying to uh, to find something and, and listen to my own voice talking. Um, so um, I don't know whether you've got anything of the thought of um, you know, obviously tracking the worker going on and off site, tracking them by the mobile phone isn't very accurate as such uh, location wise. Um, no. We did some work many years ago with Commit on looking at the proximity of people to machinery. Um, so you weren't walking behind certain things or in the swing arc of a vehicle or whatever that might be. Um, and it wouldn't take a lot to put a, a sensor of some sort in the hard hat or on the, the, the vest or whatever it is. And if you come within a certain distance of somebody, the alarm goes off and tells you to back them off. Um, and obviously, if you can then track how many times this person's been told to back off and so that they're constantly ignoring it, it's time for a little bit of retraining and re-education. Absolutely, so just on that point, we've already looked at software like that and looked at options for doing that. Ah. And that will be coming down the line. However, right this minute in time, we're talking in this short-term space, at this moment in time, we looked at the tags and looking mm. at implementing them. However, suppliers are shut and getting deliveries to site at this minute in time. So what we've decided is the very first short-term goal will be reassuring people don't have to worry about going to work because they've already got a measure in place to say that many people can only work in that area. So they tell their wives and their family going to work and we do have a measure. We're not just all going and turning up. So there's that bit. Yeah. The next bit is that obviously by using VisiLink for the planning aspect, they're already going to be using their phone at the moment to update the task. So at this minimum, we are, at moment, we are looking at either Bluetooth sensors and beacons and stuff like that just on site or even from the GPS side of it, which we're looking at all their technology options. But the end goal for me is to be We're already looking at that at the moment. We, can, we can't implement and start looking at suppliers. Hard hat sensors. If you put a tag goes on a hard hat or a sensor goes on, if it gets on, they could lose it. Something like the hard hat's a perfect opportunity, yeah. but at the moment we've then got to buy the materials and then there's the hardware supply. And then so we're on about short term. And at the same time, what we're offering right now, we're offering everyone for three months for free. So they can at least put a measure in place for companies to get back on track, at least have some measurements until we release what we're going to bring out shortly down the line. But we don't want to release too much at the moment. the bandwagon, but we want to put measures in place so that you can help with the safe distancing. That sounds great. We had a, a few issues there with the uh, with the sound quality whilst you were talking. I think as you were moving backwards and forwards towards oh, the mic. Sorry. So what what you were um, the kind of the offer bit that you've got there? If you can give us a, a bit of spiel on that, and we'll get it up on the website alongside the video, that will be fantastic. Yes. Um, just a couple of other no uh, points that I wanted just to bring. I don't know whether anybody's seen, um, there's a, a fantastic uh, video up on the internet. Somebody has fitted on a hard hat. Um, it's like a, a laser level, which produces a laser line around you of two meters. <laughs> okay. Completely stupid, but if it works <laughs> and it's stupid, it isn't stupid. Um, so yeah, it's, <laughs> it's quite insane. Um, and the other one to, to, to look at, and I don't know whether other construction companies are, are thinking of this, and I put this out to all our construction members, is that um, in China, I've been doing quite a lot of uh, 
interviews and chats with some of the construction sites in China, they're putting decontamination portals at the entrances and exits of the site. So as you walk onto the site, you're sprayed with whatever it might be. Um, so therefore, if there's anything on your clothing, on your gloves, on your hard hat, on the surfaces, etc., you don't bring that onto the site itself. Obviously, they're doing temperature testing and other things, but the temperature of your body doesn't necessarily say that you haven't got something on some of the material or some of the bits on your your equipment that you're bringing on site. Um, so they're carrying out these sort of portal decontaminations on the way to uh, on and off the site, which is bringing another level of assurance uh, in yes. that area. I don't know how well that will go down in the UK. Um, one, obviously, we don't like things like that particularly, and two, there's always the conspiracy theorists that in 10, 15, 20 years time, um, suddenly we're going to get um, respiratory problems, <laughs> et cetera, et cetera, from having breathed in. Um, although, as as I say, getting a little political here, as Mr. Trump says, it's not a problem. We can inject um, methyl into our bodies and it's no worries and we'll kill the virus that way. <laughs> yes. I'm sure we'll be fine. Uh, yes, indeed. Yes. Fantastic. There's a question that appeared. Martin, do you want to ask him yourself? Because you're yeah, on Yeah, yeah, right. sure. Just... So it's a question about the sort of height separation of GPS, you can have loads of people in terms of same uh, GPS coordinates, but they're all stacked up on scaffolding. Mm -hmm. Is it good enough to differentiate height to uh, uh, two or three meters? At the moment, we're looking at every, we, we don't believe that GPS is gonna be enough accuracy. We're looking at the all aspects from uh, Bluetooth beacons on site or tags that they can walk into a room and it will, you know, and you put them on site, but it's all, all being tested out at the moment because when it won't be a, for a couple of months we're looking at every angle to try and get as much accuracy as we possibly can so at the moment i can't say for sure because we we need to make sure that we get it right or, or what we're offering so at the end of the day what it's it's i think the other side of it is going to be we we really think it's going to come about claims you're going to have somebody that goes back to work and gets sick and goes off sick uh, or the cust is it the client's fault? Is it the main contractor's fault? Was it his own fault? Uh, and it's going to be a grey area. And no one's going to probably really, apart from like you're saying, with some sort of fist that says you're two metres, still doesn't stop, stop you walking into a zone if somebody else is two metre. Um, so it's really about being able to say, look, we've done Mr. Client or Mr. Main Contractor. We've put every measure in place to say, not only did we say they could only have a certain amount of people in these areas, that we're actually tracking to see where they're moving so if he decides to go and see his friend on zone four just because he wants a tea break it will alert that they're in a two you know within a radius so there's lots of different angles at it we we haven't mastered that bit that's coming down that's coming shortly but this bit's going to be available by the end of next week where you can at least start putting reassurance in of numbers of people being able to work in a certain area that's fabulous. That's a, um, a, a challenge I would throw out to the CodeGate guys or any of the other um, commit technology people out there who are used to dealing with proximity sensors, with RFIDs, with Bluetooth technology. How, do we, how can we do that? Uh, and I'm sure there's a few out there that are working on that that might be able to, to throw some thoughts and processes in uh, into the pod as well. We so, we have Brilliant. just so you know we, we've hope, we've already been in court uh, with companies already and it looks fancy it looks good but at the end of the day it's all that they can work with and they have um can you not hear no you've got to you're gonna to have to aim your voice towards the microphone because uh, as soon as you turn your head away it goes <laughs> that's it how's that hey. I apologise. No, we're, we're, we're looking at all the angles uh, of this at the moment. Um, we've looked at software companies already that provide this, but what they're actually delivering is just data and tracking. They've not got, it's nothing other than data. Um, we've looked at this and we believe that we can do it ourselves. So watch this space. Brilliant. Thank you. Excellent. Well, thank you very much, James. That was really good. Um, certainly uh, some things we're going to watch. Give us a, come back and give us an update in a of couple course. of months time when, when you've got some bits and bobs. Do you need any um, sites for filing or for, for doing um, demonstrations? 
uh, we've got the Mesa in Ireland are going to be using this um, live on this make the make the safety distancing thing within the, as soon as it comes out. It was designed, it was their idea, and we thought it would be such a great idea to enhance what they were asking. So yes, we've also had in the last two weeks we've had because um, we've offered this out free for at least three months. We have got some small and some very large companies that have said we're really interested in doing this um because you know whilst it's there we can't even have not even so much safety distancing it's collaborative planning session the mm. workers are out there but they, they can't they can't actually collaborate now we're obviously in a full digital collaboration system where you can do it from anywhere in the world not to yeah. say that meetings shouldn't go on but we'll see we'll see we've got a yeah. we've got a number of contractors and clients on the um on the webinar today and i'm sure there'll be um Fair bit of interest there so if there's any follow-up we'll point them in your direction great stuff thank you okay great fantastic so the next the next presentation we've got is um how to how a construction data trust could transform how we deliver projects now that's going to be delivered by martin who everybody can see i think he's on the left hand side of the screen certainly on mine um martin martin's the uh, founder and ceo of uh, projecting success and um Martin, I'll let you do your own intro because uh, it, it's fairly uh, it's fairly lengthy and uh, you've got a story to tell. Yeah, so yeah. over to you for the second part. Okay, Thank thanks you. a lot, Stuart. Appreciate that. So have I got control in, or is it? Uh... Um, I can. I'll have a go, and if it doesn't work, I will do it myself. So you should have control. There's a few build slides in there as well. Hey, there we go. Science, nice science. Look at that. Brilliant. Thank you. <laughs> so, I'm going to talk to you today about the Construction Data Trust. So, I've been working on this for uh, probably two years now with some of Calpine mainly. We've been talking to the Open Data Institute um, and people like UCL as well. Um, in the past uh, six months or so, Kia's joined us, Mace have joined us, and there's another uh, 70 companies now expressing. Uh, an interest in getting aboard this this concept and this uh, transformational future. So let me run you through what it's all about. So this slide came from uh, Crossrail. So Crossrail have got a load of data. Um, I've got two sorts of data. They've got the data which goes into a rail for London, and that's used to manage the Elizabeth line. And they've got loads of data. That data in blue which just comes out the back of a project as a big exhaust plume. And it sits on servers and some of it will never see the light of day again. I've tried to get hold of it and lots of other people's tried to get hold of it and it's very difficult to do so. But what we'd like to do is to start to uh, democratize some of that data. And it's very difficult to do that because some of it is it's sensitive data, uh, reputationally damaging, commercially sensitive, etc. So we're looking at independently studied that data for uh, defined use cases. So in terms of why, um, in terms of productivity, you understand what the issues are and what the challenges are associated with productivity, but it's not just about the productivity challenge, there's safety, sustainability, net zero, skills, capacity, etc. So it's starting to uh, connect lots of this data together uh, to address some of these challenges. Even today, there's still around 41 people every single year are dying on construction sites. We need to try and change that. It's been flatlining for the past five years or so. And if we can start to pull some of this data, we can start to tackle some of these problems. We'd like to start off with safety because that's a good place to start for everybody and then build it out. So the case for change, so what we do at the moment, so all of that data you saw in terms of all that uh, complexity and connected data, we take all that data and we simplify it into these lessons learned. And that's what we tend to do on Crossrail at the moment. So if you go to the Crossrail learning legacy and the Olympics learning legacy, we take something that's very, very difficult and very complicated and we just boil it up into this abstraction which is quite an anodyne statement. And I've now got 20,000 of these lessons learned. And what I'm finding is in terms of lessons learned, it's very difficult to apply in reality because they're quite abstract and anodyne and statements of the obvious like those two are there. 
So in terms of why we want to understand this, and this is working with some Calpine and Kia and various other organizations, they understand that they've got a lot of data. But the problem is that data is siloed, it's a variable quality, it's not aligned to the, the end use case as well. So that data has come from uh, digitization of forms as well in a lot of instances. So we need to re the, sort of reverse engineer the problem again and go back and say, what data do we actually need in the future and what's the time stamping of that data so we can start to answer these problems in the future. So what we'd like to do is to look at the data from a end-to-end -end viewpoint. It's not just looking at the data inside of a main contractor, for instance, it needs to be all the way through the supply chain. So we need this end-to-end -end data pipeline. But what that needs is trust, because if you go to your uh, client um, and you say, can you give me a load of data from the client on previous projects, they're probably gonna say no. So you need to build up the trust with them. And the same for your supply chain. If you start to beat them up with the data, they won't share it with you. So we need this aligned and integrated vision. And that's what we're working up at the moment. So what the vision is basically, it's a world whereby we can start to anticipate these health and safety incidents in advance. It's where we can start to anticipate variance as well on projects, where we think things are gonna go wrong and where we think certain parts of project are more are predisposed to things going wrong than other parts of project. And we've got that in the data set, it's all in there at the moment. And we know that things need certain attention and things are laden with bias as well. And we can start to get inside of those. So we can start to understand the likely risks and that's based upon the shared experience. So we talk about these black swan events and there's a lot of black swan events in the project management world, but that's because the person who's running the project or the team who's running the project have only seen X number of projects. If we can pull that experience so that team have seen a thousand times X, then those black swan incidents become fewer and fewer and fewer because it's more knowable. And once it's knowable, it's not a improbable event anymore. So it's things like quality issues, we can super optimize logistics, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And companies such as James can't do this at the moment because you can't get your hands on the data and you can't get your hands on the data because it's all siloed and it's stuck everywhere. So we'd like to try and change that and to give innovators such as James an opportunity to get into this market and start to solve some of these problems. So in terms of safety data, We've been talking to the health and safety executive and they came to our last hackathon and they're part of this as well through discovering safety. Uh, so if we could take the safety audit data, the RIDOR data, the incident data, near misses observation data, just imagine what we could do with all of that data. But the problem is, if you've only got one organization's data and we start to get some very clever people looking at data and they said, you should have done something earlier, you've got implications then in terms of potential negligence claims. Once we start to pool it, we start to join it together, it starts to become aggregated data. And once it's aggregated, we start to reduce that risk of a legal consequence. So it means then we can start to work together for the greater good of the industry. And we've also got a moral duty to do this, especially in terms of safety data. But it's not just about the safety data. Uh, I thought I'd press, press the down arrow. There we go. Um, it's about innovation as well. So it's take away these barriers to innovators. As I say at the moment, it's very difficult to get data. If you do get data, it's given to one organization. And that one organization, if they get loads and loads of data, uh, something like Oracle, for instance, and they become a dominant monopoly, and that just then creates loads of barriers for innovators to get into the market. So we'd like to uh, democratize it. Now it's gonna be some uh, terms of use agreements associated with this data. So you can't just sell it to the Sunday Times and try and uh, create embarrassment for lots of people. Um, and it needs an ecosystem. And that starts to open up opportunities then for staff to start to innovate inside of these companies. So they've got Power BI, they've got access to things like Azure Machine Learning, et cetera. And they've got uh, things like power apps as well. So they can start to create some of this themselves. We can start to work with PhDs and start to throw a lot of PhD effort 
and the queuing up to start to work on this stuff as well. So once we get the volume of data, we'll start to create loads of PhDs and there'll be huge amounts of opportunities. And the UK could lead the world on this. Um, and in terms of the vendors as well, they would start to look at this as an entire ecosystem and start to plug into this ecosystem. So it's not just a black box artificial intelligence algorithm, it's working with other people in this ecosystem. So it all joins together. So it's a system of systems approach with validated data. And that's what's nice about it. You can have 300,000, 400,000, 10 million schedules, but if some of them is coming from India, for instance, what's it's relevant to this situation? And we're making sure that that data reads across. So we can move much, much quicker instead of one organization trying to do them this by themselves in terms of a main contractor or supplier or a vendor, we can move a lot, lot quicker if we work collegiately and all pull together. And that's what we're trying to do. So in terms of how it's going to work and what we're going to do, we've currently got all this data in different silos. We've got the project envelope data. We've got the cost data, schedule data, risks, lessons, security data, safety data, logistics, you know, there's loads and loads of these silos of data. We start to fix some of this at the moment through a common data environment, but what we're looking at doing is to join those data sets together, because once we start to join them together, we can do multiple queries across those data sets. So we then need to password protect it, because once it's all joined together, there's a load of insights you can get from that data. If that gets in the wrong hands, then there might be legal consequences, commercial consequences of it. So we then need to password protect each of these data sets, and that could also be done at a cell level. So it means you've got security down to data component level. So we take the data on project one, uh, connect it with project N inside of one organization, and then start to join it with lots of other organizations. And that's when you join it all together, and that's when the magic happens. So you start to get this fully connected data set, which gives you almost infinite opportunities. So in terms of taking this forward, we see a three-step uh, process to it. The first one is the mobilization about the governance and the trust structure. We've done some of that already. So we've also been working with the Oil and Gas Authority and the Oil and Gas Technology Center to do something similar in the oil and gas sector. We've got people like uh, Petrofac on board, um, uh, CNOC and uh, Criso, so all these companies who's uh, bought up some of Shell's inventory in the uh, uh, continental shelf. We then need to get these enablers in place, which is stakeholder engagement and data extraction. And what we don't want to create as a massive burden is somebody's going to spend months and months of their life just ripping this data out. It needs to be automated where we can. We need to assess the data quality. And then we need to start to pilot it as well. But we don't want to do this on a big bang basis. You just turn up with a tipper truck and just get loads and loads and loads of data. And we spend the next 10 years just picking it apart. Let's start with something quite small, which is going to be safety data and see what we can do with it through things like the hackathon. So we run a project hack, which is a community event once every three months, and that's held at the Microsoft Reactor in London. And we get a load of people in. Um, it's a notional price to go in, and all that money goes to charity, and it's to get people to work together to solve some of these problems that we've been talking about. And some of those problems James has been uh, tackling with, we tackle similar ones through the hackathon and try and democratize it. So in terms of this agile iteration, we'd like to go through safety first and then into quality, sustainability, and then move into logistics and schedule data, risk data, cost data, et cetera. And you've got to be careful about being accused of collusion and things like that. So there's loads of legal issues associated with this and we need to work through those. But we need to see what data we've got, work up the access to that data, work up some solutions, and that's in terms of solutions for the data trust, but it's also about extracting value from it as well. And then we need to iterate. Uh, so in terms of next steps, um, this has been building and building and building. And we were starting to get somewhere until uh, COVID-19 came along. So we're just about to set up the company. So there's going to be a limited company with a not-for-profit mandate. Um, and that company has been formed at the moment. It's called the Construction Data Trust. Um, and it's taken a bit longer because trust is a protected word. So you need to go and justify it. The legal advisor has got uh, COVID-19, so he's disappeared for a few weeks as well. We've not heard from him since, I do hope as well. Um, so things have gone back a little bit, but 
we're still cracking on with it. We've got 70 companies interested in it. Plus, if you are interested, then please reach out to me. And my email address was at the start, but find me on LinkedIn as well, Martin Paver. Um, we're trying to drive this forward uh, collegiately, right? Um, and once we get this data going in volume, that's when we get the critical mass to change the industry. So in terms of the trust, all the governance arrangements need to be sorted out, all the legals, the technical architecture, all the processes. So we're seeking funding to mobilize. So it was going great in terms of construction. Now some of those sponsors start to fall away because of the, the uh, cash crisis, but we've got some innovation funding uh, from the oil and gas sector as well. And we can read some of that across into construction. And then we can start to mobilize. So things are moving. Um, it's taken us a long time to get this Oh, but it's so big and so bold in terms of the vision you, know, you can't do that in a few months um, and it's taking the industry with us so the website is now live so go and have a look at datatrust.construction you'll find loads of stuff in there uh, there's a paper as well a white paper i've asked been asked loads of questions about it and we've done a bit of a brochure in there about you know what this trust is all about and how it's going to work and the governance is going to work you know i've asked being asked so many questions, we thought we'd try and clarify them all in that document. So they're in there. So the conclusion is, you know, if we're looking at this future, which is artificial intelligence enabled construction, so an autonomous project basically, which can project manage itself. If we want to move towards that future, and I don't think we'll ever get there because there's a human component to it, but we can get very close to it. If we want to get to that future, we're never going to get to it unless we've got the volume of data and it's data that we trust and it's data that's properly connected together in, in time series data. So we think that the construction data trust opens up this future. It's a thing that innovators are really crying out for is access to data. The design of that trust is maturing. We've got the legal framework almost in place and now's the time to get involved. So if there's people in your community out there who want to get involved in this then they're very very welcome uh, please contact us there's a uh, contact on the website as well um and please get involved it's transformational stuff this will really uh, change the industry so that's it any questions fabulous thank you martin pleasure very enlightening <laughs> yes there are some questions um what if any technology vendors are involved, e.g. common data environment. So and at the what... moment, so we're trying to keep this vendor agnostic, right? Because if somebody like Oracle gets hold of this, you know, uh, they could claim it all as an ecosystem all for themselves. So what we're trying to say is that this is part of a broader ecosystem. So we've got a community, a bit like Comet, we've got something called the Project Data Analytics Community, which has got 5,000 members. So we'd see those members getting involved in this, and get involved in the hackathons as well. So the vendors would plug into it, but the vendors wouldn't own it. It's got to be independently steward by somebody who's not got a vested interest in selling software as such. Brilliant. That's really good to know. Yeah. yeah. Thank you for that. Um, next question we've got here is from Jade Cohen. What will your revenue model? What will be your revenue model? Will contractors stroke innovators be paying for your data? Will you be paying them for their data? So what we're saying at the moment is, and this is still being worked through and it needs to be agreed with the trustees. So we need a board of trustees and that would be the data providers themselves. Once we start putting some data in it would agree this. So it's not being confirmed by anybody yet. But the way we're thinking is what we do is we'd say, <clears throat> um, if you're a big vendor, for instance, somebody like I recall or, or you know, some of the big boys and they want to access this data, then there'll be a fee, there'll be a service fee to, and, to, to access it. If your revenue is less than two million pounds, then you get access to it for nothing. And it'd be a layered basis. And that revenue would pay for the service fees of the trust operation. And if it makes any profit, that gets reinvested in terms of fixing some of these problems that we see start to emerge and it would pay for some some PhDs or whatever. OK. Thank you. OK, the next question we've got here is from Tony, Tony Shooter. Um, there is so much data being generated. 
um, and it's been generated. How do you envisage handling such volumes? So it, it's all scalable cloud, right? So it's it's infinitely scalable. It's just making sure the architecture is robust for whatever we want to do with it. So as part of this innovation grant, we've got uh, an, uh, with oil and gas uh, companies, we've got access to some uh, technical support, and it's make sure that we can scale it up um, and make sure it's infinitely scalable. It's not just the cloud services. What's actually more important is the query time between different silos of data. And if you do it in SQL, for instance, and you're trying to hop across five or different, like five or six different sources of data, and they've got millions of data points in it, it can take you minutes to query that data. And once you start to go up to seven or eight hops of data, it can take you hours to query that data. So it's not just the data volume, it's making sure that we've got something that is robust in terms of query times as well. And we think we've got the architecture for making that happen. Uh, but we still need to go through this, you know, we'll make sure we get some wise counsel on it and work with the community to get the best answers. And there's vendors out there who will be plugging one solution and, you know, so we need to listen to them all and just find the best way forward. Yeah. Interesting. All right. Um, any more questions from anybody? Um, uh, I suppose I've got a, a question, if I may, Stuart. Yes, um, carry on. Uh, it's about, um, I suppose, the anonymization of this data. Um, obviously, if I've got data that shows the performance of my company in good and bad lights, whether I'm a construction company, a supply chain, or whatever it might be, um, that information, if it's linked to me, might be used by um, a client to make decisions on whether they accept my bids or not, as the case may be for that particular work. Um, so, you know, if that was the case, I probably wouldn't put my data into the uh, the trusts area. So, are you looking at anonymizing this data as such? So, what we do is a risk assessment on each of these data components. So, we go back to the data provider and say, this is the risk associated with your data. It's not the individual risk. And it's a bit like working in defense, for instance. Separately, a piece of data is not are protected but once it's amalgamated it becomes big enough that it gives you some insights mm. so you can look at the data in isolation you can look at the aggregation of that data as well because it starts to give you insights you didn't expect before you can reverse engineer stuff etc so what we do is a risk assessment on that data and they say based upon that risk assessment we're going to put these controls in place now what we can do is anonymize every single bit of data uh, take off anything that's uh, sensitive in it uh, but the problem is then you can't really use it for artificial intelligence because it's not got enough richness in the data. You don't want to mm -hmm. give it to researchers because there's not enough richness in the data. So we do a risk assessment and we'd say, for instance, we go back to the data provider and we'd say, although this is sensitive data, you might give it to UCL University to do this piece of research based upon this terms of use agreement. If you give it to your competitor, it's got to be at this level of aggregation and this level of, of um, anonymization or pseudonymization of data. And once we mm. start to do that, we can then start to protect the data. So it will be layered, but it's also going to be done on a risk assessment basis. Right. So it's quite a, a complex level of access permissions and aggregation and federation of information in there that as yet is to be finalized and worked out. What we'd like to do is to simplify that into some boxes, mm. right? So there's data which you're not bothered about, so that would be green and you can share it. There's data which you are sensitive about, and that'll probably fit in three sub boxes. It's the stuff you want to see uh, totally anonymized and the stuff you want to see uh, pseudonymized based upon these certain controls, and the stuff which is red, where you say, if you've got this, then you've got to come back to me and you've got to get my agreement before anything's done with it. Mm. Because I can see, yeah, because I can see information like this being very valuable to people like uh, the insurance industry, um, uh, financial investors, whether they're going to be investing in your contracting um, uh, or project and such. Potentially, um, that financial organisation steering the client into the where or who they choose in their supply chain, depending on the risks of past information uh, on past projects. 
So I think, you know, there's a lot of positives there. Yeah. But I think you've got a, a lot of cultural barriers to, 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 to smash through, really. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And that's why it's a research project. And that's why we're seeking to get some some innovation funded, because it's never been done before. And do people trust this thing? You know, if it's not trustworthy, then it's not going to fly. So we've got to make exactly. sure it's trustworthy. And that's the biggest challenge, really, is to make sure it's trustworthy. And that's why we're starting off with health and safety data, because I think that's somewhere we can all work together for the greater good. And yeah. It's not too adversarial. It's not too... Uh, competing you know everyone works to the greater good to save people's lives and make sure everybody can get home safely at night that's right and the other thing with with health and safety is we, we've we've worked really hard in the past 20 years to uh, to send the the trend down and it has been going down i know you mentioned it, it had flatlined a little bit but if you look over the 20 years it's been going down and and we've got to work even harder to yeah. maintain that that you know decrease in afr and, and yeah, it's yeah. initiatives like this that, that, that actually make the difference. Because yeah. believe me, you've really got to think differently to keep it going. Um, yeah. I mean, lit literally, you know, looking at every single aspect, what can you do to make it safer? So I think this is great, great initiative. Cool, great thank initiative. you. I'm sure. I'm, yeah, I'm get sure. on board, you know, if people want to get on board and be part of it, then just drop me a line, you know, and we'll pull you in on it. Um, Fantastic. Certainly, I'll put my name down for that because it's something that I, I, I'm exceedingly interested in. I think it's the only way forward for our industry to really get to grips with the value of information and data. So, yeah. Sure. Good. One, of the, one of the aspects of the productivity improvement um, is to look at safety and workforce management. And, and I think there's, there's an element there that this could fit into. So, yeah, yeah we We'll definitely be uh, chatting a bit further. Um, I've got several more questions of, of landed. Um, first one is from Peter Vale. Um, how is this development being aligned with existing UK initiatives, i.e. Centre for Digital Build Britain, uh, Gemini Principles, Stroke Information Management Framework? So we've been talking to Mark Enza for two years, probably. So we plugged into what they're doing. Um, we submitted an innovation a proposal and we didn't win it, unfortunately. Um, and they were part of that as well. So they wrote a letter of support for us. So they know exactly what we're doing. Um, uh, you would hope that the Centre for Digital Built Britain would be all over this, but it's a different mandate. So theirs is about the built environment and not building the environment. So the notion of a project that doesn't really fit in their remit, it's more about um, uh, digital twins in the built environment. So we've been trying to expand their mandate out a little bit to sort of touch on this, but we've got to make sure it's aligned, and especially these integrated data ecosystems. But a part of our work right now structure is to make sure that we're speaking to them. Anything we come up with in terms of standards and things like that is totally aligned. But what we don't want to do as well is to mandate a load of standards for data, whereby we are big taxonomies that everybody's got to use. We need to be smarter these days and use data science to use synonyms and to find out that X equals Y instead of trying to prescribe everything because that doesn't work. We've seen it doesn't work. They've tried it in the oil and gas sector. It, it just doesn't work. So we need to be really smart about the way we use standards in this environment. Okay, thank you. Um, next question I've got is from Gareth Parks. Um, can you tell us more about the output so far from hackathons, please? Been some cool stuff actually. So Gareth's been a part of it, and I think he's probably picking me up because I've missed that out. So Gareth's been a big advocate of this. So Gareth turned up to the last meeting, so the last hackathon, and he's got some apprentices on board. So we got five apprentices from Sir Robert McAlpine, and we run this project data analytics apprenticeship. And it's not just for 18 year olds, you know, somebody's on it who's 43, and it's a way of just reskilling because if you're a QS, if you're a document controller, if you're in health and safety, your job's going to change massively in the next few years, right? And there's going to be some youngsters who's going in for that sort of work. So what we did, we brought those people into this hackathon. Gareth has set a challenge which says, in terms of the data for a specification, for instance, if you get a client spec, it's got a load of standards in it. And can you tell me whether those standards are obsolete or relevant or they've got errors in them? 
So we set that challenge and over a weekend, I have a small team of six people solved that challenge with an app and now it's been productionized and they're giving it away. Um, right. Another one was using um, a machine vision to look at your PPE, for instance, and to make sure you're wearing the right PPE going on site. And at least three teams solved that over a weekend. So that was pretty cool. And there's one a team with a couple of PhDs in it who was doing with edge devices, you know, using Raspberry Pi. So it'd be really cheap to implement. So that was pretty cool. Um, and we had another team as well. So we're looking at safety observation data. And the problem is with safety observation data, you've got to fill in, in forms and things like that. So we said, hey, could you create a voice app, which then starts to trigger a workflow and that workflow would say, you know, if there's a safety observation that is significant, it goes to this person. If it's not significant, it goes to this uh, data set and we can pull the data, et cetera. Now, what that does is it gives us something like 100 times more data in terms of data volumes, which means in two years time, once we start to apply artificial intelligence to it, we've got a lot more data. So we need to think smarter about not just using this kit because it's going to help us now. It's the data that's going to help us in the future. So those are just three examples from this hackathon where we start to uh, solve these problems. So if you're interested, I've just put Project Hack 6 live. It's going to be a virtual event. It's all online through Zoom. Uh, so just Google Project Hack 6 on Eventbrite and sign up. It's all free uh, and come along and we'll steer you through it. And if you've got any challenges that you'd like us to uh, tackle and bring some data, then get in touch with me and we'll make it happen. And if you're interested in the apprenticeship as well, then go to projectingsuccess.co.uk and there's a bit on apprenticeships on there um, and sign up because it's the future. You know, a lot of people's jobs in project delivery are going to get impacted by this and you can't just stick your head in the sand. Yeah. You need to start to react to it and really get ready for it because it's going to be massive. You know, when we get this data trust going, we need to make sure we've got people who can delve into that data trust and really make a difference. Sure, sure. Okay, thank, thanks for that. Uh, two more questions um, from Peter, Peter Vale. Uh, how are you measuring or defining benefits to encourage adoption? So in the first workshop, we had um, uh, about a three-hour session on this with Kia, uh, Health and Safety Executive, Mace, various other people. Um, and we've got a raft of benefits that they want to see from it. So they're all documented. I think there's a big chunk of them um, a recent slide deck that we've been working on so it's in there um we just need to link it back to some of these work packages and make sure we drive it through so it's very early days you know the company's just been set up we're doing this on a shoestring um so we've been looking for some funding from government to make it happen so i think it's going to come first and foremost through the oil and gas sector but that's taken me two years to get to that point um so it's just making sure we've got the business case that's resilient and it's differentiating between that big goal and that big vision versus the more tactical things that people want to see. Like, for instance, uh, get some benefits out of this health and safety data. But those benefits are emergent as well, because this is all brand new. As we find data, we start to plug it together, we'll start to see patterns in the data that we didn't expect. Sure. We'll see feature engineering through artificial intelligence that you see different things popping up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Fantastic. Sorry, go on, Liam. Go on. Stuart, unfortunately, we're at the top of the hour, um, and so we're going to have to uh, call the uh, the happy hour to a close. Um, but we've got those questions um, down on uh, the electronic question thing. So what we'll do is we will send those through to Martin and any other questions through to James and get those answered uh, in words, in typing, and put them up on the website alongside the video. Oh. Um, so we'll be able to, uh, to, to make sure those are answered. So it just really leads yes. me to say um, thank you very much to Stuart for organising uh, today oh, and you. to Martin and James for two excellent presentations and some really interesting thoughts where we're moving forward, not only in the safety world, but also in the, uh, the data world. Two things that are very close to, I think, a lot of people's hearts within the construction industry and things we need to resolve quite quickly. So uh, I just want to uh, to wish everybody uh, a very happy weekend coming up um, and to make sure that you join us again next week at 3.30 
uh, for the next Commit Happy Hour. I hope you've all got a, a glass well charged and you've all had a few drinks in the pub as we've been sitting here. Um, and I'll just raise a toast to you all. Good health, stay safe, and we'll see you all next week. See you guys. Thank you.